Hello and welcome back to the Road Centre podcast. My name is Mark Blythe. I'm the Director of the Road Centre for International Economics and Finance at the Watson Institute at Brown University. And this is the Road Centre podcast, but you know that because you're listening. So who have we got on this week and why are we bringing them on? You may remember a few podcasts back, we had um, a guy who came on to talk about Chinese foreign policy. And what was the story there? Well, David McCourt told us the sociological story about how the kind of the field of China studies in that sociological sense got moved over time endogenously long before Trump. And that the old kind of we're all going to play happy together in the global economy narrative had really died in the China watcher community. And in a sense, Trump was just fulfilling what was already in motion. This is related to where we're going to go today. Excellent new book out. It's called Exit from Hegemony, The Unraveling of the American Global Order by Alexander Cooley and Dan Nixon, who are with me today. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us, Mark. You're more than welcome. All right, so basically the title says it all, but let's fill in the blanks, right? Exit from Hegemony. What is that referred to specifically? And I've been in the United States 30 years. People have been writing about the decline of US power for the past 40 years. Why is it that you guys think this time is different? Yeah, it's a great question. It's perhaps the most important question. So you're right. Um, sort of declinism, if you want to think about that that way, has been a, a, a cottage growth industry. And anytime we've had a global economic crisis, you've seen academics and policymakers talk about impending U.S. decline. And this happened after the early 70s and the oil shock and economic crisis. It happened again in the 1980s, of course, when we uh, had uh, the kind of classic by Paul Kennedy rise and decline of the great powers. And the thesis there was that great powers become overextended. Uh, they can't um, you know, continue the sort of burden of maintaining these overseas commitments and they hollow themselves out. Well, a few years after Kennedy's very influential books, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the U.S., uh, Japan stagnated, Germany tried to absorb an entire country, and the U.S. was really alone in terms of its primacy. And then very quickly, a few years after Paul Kennedy's book, we were talking about, um, will U.S. unipolarity and primacy persist forever? And then is the U.S. an empire? So you're absolutely right to ask the skeptical question. Our point in this book is that many of the same mechanisms that sustained U.S. hegemony, um, this uh, mythical liberal international order, especially from the 90s, have been transformed. And they've been transformed in a way that's undermining U.S. power. And this is a process that predates Trump. In our view, Trump is an accelerant, and he has certainly fueled a lot of these dynamics. But this was going to happen whether or not Trump was there, and it's going to endure uh, regardless of who um, is elected in November. Um, so I think you're right to be skeptical and to put this in a historical context, but our view is that the hollowing out has already taken place. It's not something that's on the horizon. It's not something that may happen as a result of COVID. Um, it's there. It's just we haven't been looking for it in the right places. So let me switch over to Dan. So going from what Alex said there, Let's pick up on one phrase, hollowing out. What's distinctive about your account, in my view, is actually this notion that it's hollowing out. This is an endogenous process rather than the classic sort of exogenous model where the rising challenger comes up in this geopolitical warfare along the kind of Thucydides trap line. Can you tell us something more about this kind of endogenous hollowing out account that you develop? Well, fundamentally, we agree with the classic account which is that the if you want to ask about the very basic drivers of this hollowing out, which I'll get to in a second, uh, it is shifts in relative economic power. And most notably, the rise of China, the relative rise of China uh, from being you know 8 to 10% of global GDP to now being in PPP terms, uh, having a larger share of global GDP than the United States. There are other though, economic shifts that are independent of that. Uh, and those include things like the rise of Asia in general, uh, the rise of the so-called BRICS. Um, and indeed, over the long term, actually, power has, by a lot of measures, has been diffusing away from the United States for much, much longer uh, than the last decade or 15 years. 
But what really makes our argument distinctive is those accounts basically focus on the question of whether or not there will be a power transition or a hegemonic war. Right? That is whether or not uh, we are doomed to a militarized conflict with China as it stretches its you know, as it sort of stretches its appetites and tries to become the dominant power, uh, and the United States uh, tries to lock in its position. So the classic um, war that you know this is supposed to be what happened in World War One with the UK and Germany. It's supposed to be what happened in uh, potentially the the Napoleonic Wars with France. Uh, it's supposed to be what happened between Spain and France in the 16th century, uh, and then uh, classically it's supposed to be what happened between Athens and Sparta. And that's a really important question, whether or not there'll be a war, but it ignores these other processes that are really the ones that are transforming order uh, before you ever get the kind of big bang. Uh, and even if you don't get the big bang. Uh, and these are essentially the way that we should understand uh, how hegemony and leadership works is that the main way in which dominant powers make international politics look the way they want it to look is by offering international goods, that is security guarantees, in the modern era, development assistance, um, trade arrangements, uh, and both the way in which they offer those kinds of goods uh, and what they condition those goods upon is how they're able to then get states to or adjust their foreign policies, their domestic economic policies, you know, to, to adopt more liberal marketization, for example, or to adopt more protectionism in some circumstances, or to accede to, say, dollar hegemony, right, to the use of dollarization. And what's happened is that in, in the 90s, the United States uh, enjoyed a de facto monopoly over that kind of international patronage, that kind of goods patronage. And it was a de facto monopoly because it wasn't just the United States, it was really a cartel of the United States and the other advanced industrialized democracies who were all... They had their disagreements. They had different priorities. They had some different visions of what liberal economic order looked like, but they were more or less on the same page. Um, and what's happened now is that the United States has lost that de facto monopoly, and it's lost it because of the diffusion of power away from the United States. The United States has simply not no longer been the only game in town. And so other countries that are looking for patronage have increasingly been able to go elsewhere. And even if they don't go elsewhere, they've been able to threaten to go elsewhere, meaning that the United States has to offer them more favorable terms if it wants to maintain that patronage relationship in terms that are generally ones that uh, look less like the order it wants and more like the order that recipients want. Um, the way the example I like to use is, yeah, so and but there's a so that's the main dynamic. But along with those power transition dynamics, when those shifts start to happen, we point to other factors. So one of them is the classic one of uh, rising powers who start getting interested in constructing their own order. But again, unlike these classic hegemonic war accounts, we're actually interested in the politics of the construction of that order and the way it it shapes. Uh, contestation over norms, roles, and arrangements. Uh, and then we also pay a lot of attention to something which is really missing from a lot of these accounts, which is the way that that power transitions affect the viability and the aspirations of counter-order movements, right? That is political parties and social movements that don't like things about the distribution of goods or values in the order and start pushing against it, often from within the core states of that order. So let's pick up on that point. That's one of the most fascinating parts of the book. I was at Johns Hopkins for a while, as you know. I was a, 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 um, I shared a department with Margaret uh, Keck of Keck and Sicking fame, who wrote this book called Activists Beyond Borders. And I thought that the middle of your book could be called Activists Beyond Borders that nobody wants. Right. So yeah. tell us, tell Alex, tell us that story, basically, because the way that this fascinates me is we got all the stuff in the United States about the Russia connection and the U.S. election, whatever. But what you show is this is much broader. And it's really not it's much just Russia. Better. So what, what's going on there and how does it undermine American order? Yeah, so we could use the counter slogan, the activists have been grounded and then completely rolled back, right? And so, yeah, in the 1990s, it was very fashionable to look at transnational movements and confuse their purpose with their form, right? The idea that um, transnational movements were more nimble, they were cleverer, they're more agile than states, and they linked up similarly principled actors. But of course, the only cases that we saw were good progressive liberal causes, right? Human rights, gender equality, uh, the environment, campaign against landmines. The real turning point in our account is really the mid-2000s. And um, if you have to point to a single event, it's probably the colored revolutions in Eurasia. Uh, 
Georgia 2003, Ukraine 2004, Kyrgyzstan 2005, and then there's a second wave in the Arab Spring, of course, at the beginning of the next decade. And the reason that these are turning points is that democracy and democracy promotion gets recoded from a nuisance and an annoyance to an actual regime threat, an actual security threat, right? And NGOs are viewed as the frontline foot soldiers in this. Now, in many cases, they're stigmatized, unjustly so. But you also have cases where um, U.S. government and American academics are getting credit for what happened in Ukraine in 2004, saying that NGOs were key to this effort and you know, support um, for civil society was key to this effort. At that point, Russia starts pushing back but so do a number of other countries. At first, it's a defensive move. So you see these waves of anti-NGO laws, foreign funding restrictions, um, you have new registration requirements, um, you know, a very kind of cumbersome sort of state apparatus. And then you get the act of rolling back. So not only in some cases, like in Russia, the criminalization of undesirable organizations, like it's not that we just don't want you, you're a criminal organization here, right? You actually start getting kind of political technological innovations. So the rollout of the Gongo, the government sponsored uh, organization. So for example, the OSCE has a civil society forum where NGOs can, can go there and give their sort of briefs and opinions on policy. Well, what if you start using that same space as an authoritarian government to flood with your Gongos? And that's what they started to do. And so these four that were meant to operate in this very kind of classical transnational civil society started to become co-opted and taken over. Now to the point where we have transnational illiberal movements that are jostling with their liberal counterparts. And the example we bring up is the World Congress of Families, funded initially domestically in the U.S. by a couple of Christian right organizations that in the um, 2000s become merged and fused with Eurasian uh, oligarch patronage. Uh, and they start holding these national conferences in which they bring different, uh, um, you know, uh, generally conservative traditional values groups on board for uh, anti-LGBT agendas, um, opposing reproductive rights. Uh, the migration issue was quite uh, big in this. And so all of a sudden now this goes way beyond Eurasia and way beyond the US. It's a network that uh, held a meeting in Verona uh, to take a part of La Liga, uh, Liga uh, uh, Norda allies, um, and has plans to expand into Latin America in places like Brazil and so forth. So I think the overall point is, look, um, we assume that this went one way. We assume that these forms of global governance could only give us one set of policy outcomes, which was a relentless convergence homogenization in terms of liberal politics. Not only can those be stopped, like the activists can be grounded, you can get counter order movements that can be just as effective. And that's what's truly distinctive about the world that we're looking at now. That and the intense polarization in which um, liberal and illiberal networks are now getting their domestic allies within the West. One of the big things that we do in the book. So the, the book actually originated the this art. We were doing the work for this starting in the mid to late 2000s. So it's been in gestation for a long time. But part of what pushed us forward into finally finishing the thing was, first of all, we had a grant, we had to get a deliverable in. But secondly, it was that it was Trump's election, right? And the big debate about Trump and US foreign policy and the fate of the liberal order, which pushed a lot of these issues to the forefront in a way that, you know, they were, you know, eating up space in foreign affairs, uh, opinion editorials, things like that. So, you know, as, as Alec, we sort of said at the outset, we think that a lot of these dynamics are independent of Trump and we don't want to get too focused on Trump per se. But the fact of the matter is what's really, I think, striking about this moment is that Trumpism itself represents part of this counter order wave. Right. So right, what we call right wing populism, you know, rejects very fundamental features of international liberal order. You know, you see this with the Alternatives for Germany or Alternatives for Deutschland. You see this with the Freedom Party in Austria. You see this with the Liga in, in, uh, in more complicated ways with the Five Star Movement in Italy. Uh, you see this uh, with Duterte in uh, the Philippines. Um, and so there are uh, there are a lot of movement in Modi to some degree in India, right? So you see all these movements that are sort of 
arguing for national sovereignty against liberal norms and values, particularly on political rights uh, that are interested in rolling back aspects of democratization, and that Trumpism is really in bed with a lot of these movements. Mm -hmm. These are all kind of the same broad right. spectrum. So, so but let me jump in on it. See, this is what I find fascinating about this stuff. So we all studied international relations uh, at some point in our graduate careers. And the sort of the standard models assume some kind of baseline rationality of state action. And what your book is suggesting is that's kind of fundamentally flawed in some way, because really these domestic components, there's always, as you say, there's always been great power rivalries, whatever. China's a new big kid on the block. You can expect some tensions. But it's these domestic flows that get really, really interesting. Here. Because essentially, if Trump is an accelerant, what he's doing is he's undermining the sources of his own power, right? That's not rational by anybody's reading of rationality. So how do we get our heads around this, right? Why would you want to go further down the road to weakening your own power if you're on the most powerful state? It's contradictory if you think about aspects of the Trump agenda, right? So we have a lot to say about how if you think, for example, that we're in this great power rivalry with China or potentially a new Cold War, which a lot of people in the administration do, none of this stuff makes sense. <laughs> because you're undermining the sort of core infrastructure of American power, uh, you're undermining the brand, right? You're doing all these things that 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 basically take these advantages we had over the Chinese, and you're saying we're gonna we're gonna scrap them, you know. And this goes down to even things like hollowing out the U.S. diplomatic corps, right, and reducing U.S. diplomatic capital. However, if you are a kind of in in the sort of bowels of Trumpist ideology in or in the same amorphous stuff. It kind of does make sense because you think that all of these um, institutions that are actually fairly fundamental to U.S. power are essentially ways of of limiting U.S. freedom of action. That's the old we've all, we've heard that argument for a very long time. We've heard it from John Bolton. We've heard it from others. Um, but you also think that they are forcing the United States to adopt uh, or locking the United States into certain kinds of policies that you don't like, right? Ideologically. Uh, and so your impulse is to say, let's scrap them, right? Uh, let's uh, destroy them so that we can have a domestic politics that is looks more like the domestic politics we want, which is more illiberal, uh, more xenophobic, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a matter of how you balance those concerns. Right. One of the things though, that I think is really interesting, and, and Alex can, can elaborate on this, is that there is a fundamental wager here at the geopolitical level. And the fundamental wager is that the United States is one of the is the most powerful country on the planet. Um, it is still twenty three to twenty four percent of global GDP. It's actually doing better relatively than than Europe has been in the last you know few years. Uh, and that uh, if it would be in the art in the sense is that what would be best for the United States and best particularly for this kind of more illiberal populist right agenda is if the world could be reduced to one of great power competition. Right or great power cooperation, great power relations, and we could get out of these pesky arrangements and institutions and agreements, which essentially are weapons of the weak. Right, Alex, do you want to add on this? Yeah, I mean, I think the logic strip bear is one of hard bargaining bilaterally, right? And which is why you want to pry the UK out of the EU. It's why you want to disintegrate the EU. You're not viewing them as power resources. You're viewing them as competitors, competitors that. You strip out all this other stuff, norms, rules, standards, uh, diplomacy, and you can, get your, you can get your way, right? That's the logic. The problem, and, and, and in some cases, to be fair, in some cases, that kind of leverage over international institutions works, right? We, 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 we cited an example in a recent op-ed we did of this renegotiation of the International Postal Union right, that the Trump administration insists on, say, no, we're pulling out of this thing. And they had no choice but to actually agree to sort of China paying, you know, increased rates, making adjustments, all the things. The problem is in some issue areas where the U.S., just by definition, its participation is necessary, that tactic works. But in other areas, like global public health, when someone can step in and substitute for your patronage and leadership, um, it doesn't work. Then you're actually ceding, um, you know, the, the 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 terrain and 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 the leadership. But I think that's the fundamental uh, uh, wager. This idea that international politics is dog eat dog, and it's bilateral. It's highly transactional, 
And the other way in which Trump differs from his predecessors is that instability and unpredictability are assets. They're weapons, right? There's things that you can leverage. No, I'm getting out of this deal as opposed to U.S. leadership is credible. It's dependable. It's something that's going to be there. We can credibly commit. Um, and that's another sort of big aspect of this that's, that's kind of accelerating the unraveling um, uh, effects. Because quite frankly, even when the Biden administration comes in and you try and rebuild these, you know, uh, bricks of sort of international kind of architecture and infrastructure and cooperation, um, other countries are going to very rightly doubt U.S. Uh, credibility. So I'm trying to figure out in my own head then, these reactions, so you've got great power competition, you have alternative architectures, you have changes in the basic ecology, and you have these transnational networks. That's that's what's pushing it, right? And one way of telling the story, and I think you do both of these stories in the book simultaneously, and I want to try and sort them out. One of them is we kind of had it coming because we had wars of choice, we behaved terribly irresponsibly, we were basically the big kid with all the money and all the toys and to hell with everybody else. That created enough resentment in the system that when states such as Russia really began to realize that you were serious about regime change, they kind of had to defend themselves. So in a sense, these are defensive responses. But there's another reading. No, 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 hold on. Irrespective of that, these are offensive moves. They are literally trying to take down the system. How do we square both accounts? Or is are they simultaneously the same account and I'm just yeah. not really seeing how they fit together? Let me let me quickly push on the Russia door and then and Dan, you can sort of clean up and add things because I think this is, you know, something that's really important to understand, especially in light of a lot of punditocracy that goes on about Russia. How many times do you hear the story? Russia's a declining power, right? Uh, Russia can't do anything. Who cares what Russia thinks? Russia's a regional power, right? Which was the line from the Obama administration that really got them. What we try and do in our theoretical framework is point out there's kind of these three broad dynamics, these endogenous dynamics that you talk about. One is creation of new international institutions, right? And the Russians are doing that in their sphere. Um, Eurasian Economic Union, the security organizations, they join with the Chinese and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, they join in the BRICS. So that's adding to the ecology of Chinese and Russian-led institutions. That's kind of from above. There's this from below dynamic, though, um, where small states leverage the availability of alternate goods provisions. Here, the Russians haven't been as successful. When they tried to buy off the Kyrgyz to kick the U.S. out of the Manas military base, they just got outbid by the U.S., right? When they tried to bribe Lukashenko in Belarus to recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia, he took their cash and then didn't do it, right? And they've had a number of these things. They're not very good at that, and that's actually not a very cost-effective kind of strategy. Um, so that they're not as successful in. But you know what? On the third one, the targeting of the order itself and the West itself, that is something that's offensive because it's actually very cost-effective. Giving some money to Marine Le Pen, right, or sort of, you know, a uh, 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 funding pushing on these open doors, um, you know, uh, running election interference and social media and it's just an entirely politicized U.S. international sort of system. And more importantly, being perceived to have done as such, right? Whether they did or not, whether it was efficacious or not, having this sort of perception, it's like, yeah, you don't mess with us. Um, it's got this sort of sense, the Russians have become very sophisticated at multi-pronged targeting, right? From above, from below, from within. And they have been talking about this now for nearly 20 years, that we feel that the U.S. Uh, is hypocritical and that it shouldn't unilaterally decide what the rule sets are. Uh, we want a more kind of multipolar, polycentric system. Um, and, you know, the order itself is in our national interest, right? Out undoing the order. So it's, it's a deeply revisionist things. And in some things they succeed and in some things that fail, but we tend to look at the spectacular quote unquote failures and, and really miss, I think, this kind of hollowing out dynamic that they've been uh, uh, you know, pushing on for, for a while. Don, where do you want to go with this? Well, you know, there's a tendency in some quarters of the American left, uh, what I have called the anti-imperialist left, to look at all of the list of things that you just talked about that the United States did. And focus on that, and even some realists, right, like John Mearsheimer, and say, 
uh, look the you know his liberal bad liberalism arguments right look at all the all the things the United States did which contributed to its own you know shot itself in its foot made itself a threat to all these other actors right and so you focus on U.S. agency. There's a tendency on people who are more defensive of the United States to put all the agency on Russia and China and say, oh, no, no, it's all their aggression. And I think it's just both. Right. Right. Actors have, you know, lots of different actors have agency in international politics. The United States both kind of drove really hard aggressively to expand liberal ordering in places where it probably shouldn't have or in places where the costs were not worth the benefits that we're supposed to get from it. At the same time, there are things about liberal international order that are, in, using that term in a kind of very broad sense, which are inherently threatening to authoritarian regimes, and they're always going to want to push back against them. So even if the EU was less aggressive about Ukraine, a successful liberal democratic EU is a threat to the current Russian regime, right? If it, you know, the very fact that European Union citizens live better, <laughs> have higher standards of living, uh, that's threatening to um, the Kremlin. Now, there are ways to mitigate that, for example, but that's just the case, right? There's a similar thing with NATO. Even if NATO hadn't expanded into the Baltics, there would have been an issue with uh, NATO being this defensive pact that essentially, at the end of the day, is about deterring the Russians. Um, In the same way that the United States, even when it engages in behavior towards China, that it views as relatively benign kind of hedging behavior. You know, we don't really know what you're going to be up to, so we'll try to both engage you cooperatively, but also have this residual plan that we can deter China. That, of course, is going to be encirclement for the Chinese, right? And there's a sort of nothing you can do about some of those kinds of dynamics. Uh, um, but let's go with this uh, notion again of this being aggressive, because if that's the case, is there a way in which your argument can be weaponized by the people that you're not in favor of? Here's what I mean by this. So what you're telling me then is that we should have tariffs on China. We need to be careful. They are revisionist powers. And Trump's basically right to basically be ratcheting ratcheting stuff up on them, right? Look, I mean, I think there is a sense that once you point out the geopolitical implications of everything, like you can start targeting them. Yes. And you could redo a whole Trumpian um, playbook to, you know, uh, win a kind of Cold War 2.0 against China by becoming serious about both, you know, international organizations as a kind of playing field, um, you know, perceptions abroad and sort of, you know, domestic politics. And, and, and you could do that. And, and this isn't so much a coherent response. My own personal feeling on this is that, you know, I think, you know, COVID is accelerating both anti-U.S. and anti-Chinese sentiments, right? I, th- I think backing up, you um, We assumed in the 1990s that all of these liberal ordering principles went together, like what Tom Wright sort of calls the convergence thesis, right? That open economies and exchange, liberal democratic principles and intergovernmentalism slash multilateralism, they all reinforced each other. And that buying into the system would lead to this domestic convergence. And that was the discourse about China and Russia. It was, are they, they're going to have to play by the rules right? They're going to have to become responsible stakeholders, right? And that was, you know, the thing, as if the system itself was going to remain configured in the same way. Um, so I think, you know, it's, 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 it certainly could aggressively, you know, you know, be turned potentially against these countries. On the other hand, these very same institutions that we think we can weaponize and control, um, in reality, are, are actually quite out of the gate. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of another thing that we want to draw attention to, that a lot of these international organizations and rules and processes just don't mean now what they did in 1994 and 1995. Um, and, and it's easy to sort of, you know, let go of that. So even if you try to sort of weaponize membership in sort of, you know, the WHO or kind of World Bank lending or, um, you know, IMF provision, you know, the very, you know, um, existence now of these alternative sort of goods providers would mitigate that and would make it costly for you. And just a final thought, we have a test case of this, which was AIIB, right, and the dynamics, right, where the U.S. tried really hard, um, and this is under Obama, right, to sort of prevent the membership of this thing. And in doing so, it lost that 
and it expended a lot of its prestige and capital in doing it. In the end, only the U.S. and Japan sort of held out on it. Yeah, absolutely. The irony, of course, is Japan 20 years prior to that wanted an Asian monetary fund and the Americans put the kibosh on Indeed. that. So there's a certain Indeed. sense of justice, in a sense, coming back from that one. And, and you think about the minor order challenges in the 1990s. Right. They seem trivial, Absolutely. right, in terms of the policing of sort of hegemony that was going on at the time. You know, some of the stuff Robert Wade wrote about in the 1990s. One implication of our book is if you think we're entering a new Cold War with China and you want to prosecute a new war, Cold War with China, there's certainly ways in which our book would provide recommendations for how you ought to proceed. And one of them is not to um, mess with NATO, for example, or not to try to break up the European Union. Um, so there are a bunch of things you could do that would be better if you wanted to pursue that. My own view is that we have to draw a distinction between what we call the American system, which is by and large the kind of rump U.S. hegemonic space and hege hege hegemony in the more sometimes in the more benign sense of leadership than the more coercive sense of you know kicking around small Central American states. Um, there is the kind of core of U.S. Uh, ordering and hegemony, which is roughly coterminous with what was built during the Cold War, right? You know, maybe further west in Europe now. Um, and then there's U.S. global hegemony, which is the 1990s. And U.S. global hegemony is what's over. But the jury's still out on what's going to happen to the American system. And so if you want to compete with China, right, that means you still want to shore up the American system, right? That is, you still want to retain this robust institutionalized cooperative system that means that three quarters of global GDP is allied with the United States or what have you. Right. Um, if you don't want to do that, if you think that what a post US global hegemony world looks like is one that's more great power competition as it's classically pursued, that is not Cold War competition, but areas where you have disagreements and you compete on those disagreements and you have areas where you have agreement and you cooperate on those agreements and you don't view everything as an existential threat, right? Where you view it as power competition that sometimes can be zero sum, sometimes can be positive sum, but is not fundamentally about the very viability of your political systems. Uh, then also you want to maintain the U.S. system because you want to because in an environment where you're going to win some and you're going to lose some, uh, you want to have as many resources as possible. So the big example I give is if the U.S. wants to tackle, I mean Trump doesn't, but I think a lot of people in the U.S. would like to tackle global corruption. If the U.S. wants to tackle climate change, for example, the U.S. is much better off in an environment where it can, along with Europe, uh, mobilize both their domestic consumer markets for regulatory power and influence than it can if it's just its own market, separate and completely distinct from the European market. So matter what, there are things that you want no matter what kind of world you're trying to aim for. But our fundamental argument is because US global hegemony is done, and it's been done for, for at least a few years, except for in some very specific sectors, that your best bet is to try to adopt a small c conservative foreign policy where you conserve what you have and you show up and you press your values, but you don't make everything, uh, you know, a kind of a fall on your sword right. kind of diplomacy. So sadly, we're running out of time. So I want to turn to stuff I know about. Um, it's a very big claim that it's over in the following sense. If you if you have kind of a political economist sense of this, you begin and end with a dollar. And that's the one bit that sort of, you know, isn't in, nor should it be in your book. You, you guys work in a different space, right? I don't talk about NGOs, right? We're in different space. But when I think about it, I look at this whole system and the story I tell, which is very similar to Herman Schwartz, because basically I got it from him, is the following. Um, for every surplus, there has to be a deficit. And we do deficits. That's what we do. And that's what powers surplus countries that make stuff for export. China, Germany, the EU, writ large, etc. And the way we pay with this is with bits of paper called dollars. And you can't put those dollars in your banking system because they're a liability. You need to turn them into an asset. So you buy our T-bills because that's the global safe asset. And then you rinse and repeat through crisis and crisis. And until there's an actual substitute for the dollar, that's the real source of American power and hegemony. We can have different values. This goes with the your conclusion, one of your conclusions, in a sense, an American order without American values, which I think is highly likely. Then, in a sense, we're still stuck with the dollar as the reserve asset, but we've evacuated, as John Ruggie would have said, the social purpose of the regime, right? It, would you guys go along with that? I, I think there's a lot to that. 
Mark. And I think you're right. This is a big, um, you know, it's a big hole in the book and the argument. And it's one we've been grappling with more recently. And, and, and we have a few thoughts on it. I think U.S. dollar financial hegemony, um, and this is something that we need, I think, to, to, to explore more. Um, I think there's a danger that it's, it's, it's viewed a little bit like military power as a sort of static resource that you can run comparative statics on and that the overall sort of social configuration and its use is sort of lost. Um, you're certainly right about crisis. I do wonder, though, if some of the other points about endogenous change and hollowing out are the case, whether this particular crisis is going to differ a bit from 2008, 2009, in that you're going to see a lot less oversight, a lot more cronyism, a lot of, frankly, clientelism in the U.S. as well than you have before. This isn't about saving the automakers. This is about saving the donors. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's what's going to sort of be magnified. That's something I'd love to talk to you more uh, sort of on the side about it, in which case it takes us further down the line. I think that's one. I think second, you are right, of course, in terms of, you know, just immediate access to, you know, um, the Fed and also, you know, liquidity and so forth and these sort of standby arrangements. But the infrastructure is there and it's growing for the Chinese to do the same, right? And in fact, they have 30 standby arrangements at the moment, some of which have been tapped into, some don't, which have the potential to be activated. So if you view this as a lagging indicator, um, um, it's in the horizon. And the thing that's especially concerning, not just the China, not just to Russia, not just to Iran, but also increasingly the EU now, is the politicization of financial sanctions, right? That is viewed as something that has been deployed irresponsibly and selectively, and that workarounds need to be um, actually thought of. And that's becoming an increasingly mainstream position yeah. amongst sort of non-US countries. So I would just say, uh, yes, if we took right now as a snapshot, there is sort of, you know, all the indicators that U.S. financial power still matters, but end arounds and workarounds are being planned in a way I think that wasn't even the case sort of 10 years ago um, in a serious way. One quick question, you, Alex, before we go to Dan for the final word on this. Is Nord Stream 2 going to be the test case for this? It might be. I. It's hard for me to see um, the sort of, you know, political you know, the political consensus in the U.S. Uh, being maintained on this, right? I mean, I, I, I honestly don't think that is, is, is this going to be the test case, you know, that the U.S. is going to go through the mat. It's going to absolutely sanction and fine, you know, European entities and companies and so forth. Like, you know, maybe it will, but if it does... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think it might have exactly that kind of sort of accelerant dynamics. So, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting hill um, for, uh, for these sort of sectoral and sort of financial sanctions to die on. But there have been problems with it even before, right? Even sort of state entities and regulatory authorities using, you know, OFAC as an excuse to extract fines for sort of sanctions violations and so forth. The U.S. hasn't been a credible steward of the kind of financial sanctions regime. And I think we need to be honest about that. And I think that was even the case in, in you know, under the Obama uh, regime, um, you know, certainly seems, you know, less capricious than some of the, you know, the Trump uh, moves. Um, but I think there were always sort of counter moves uh, in the work there. Last word over and done. Well, I think one of the big things about dollar hegemony is a the the feeling that Alex has said that currency strength might be a lagging indicator, right? There's a lot of inertia, there are a lot of network effects, but certainly the United States is not able to consistently coerce other states into maintaining the various kinds of agreements and arrangements that promote dollar hegemony. Over time, we should expect it to erode. Um, and I don't know how dollar hegemony kind of magically stays around if the United States isn't actively um, taking steps and is able to actively take steps to, to manage that, right? I mean, we know the story about dollarization in the 70s, and it required the U.S. to make very intensive threats about withdrawal of club goods, for example. And if the U.S. can't do that credibly anymore, either because there are substitutes or because nobody believes that the U.S. commitments are credible, at some point, these arrangements are going to start to kind of go away. 
particularly if there's political pressure to make them go away. But more broadly, there's a question about what do you use dollar hegemony for, right? So you can use dollar hegemony for the sanctions regime, where I think we're pushing states away from wanting a world with dollar hegemony, um, or you can use it to run budget deficits, right? Um, which is what we've done, right, since the Reagan administration. But what do you do with those budget deficits? And if what you do is you start, is you don't use them for domestic investment spending, right? You don't throw lots of money at R and D and human capital and infrastructure and maintain the sort of primarily infrastructure of dom- domestic infrastructure, literally sometimes, <laughs> of U.S. power. If you continue to coast on the increasingly um, decaying uh, aftershocks of the Sputnik moment and of these massive investments we made in the Cold War in in these kinds of programs, uh, then at some, if you're just basically using it to finance tax cuts, for example, at some point that dollar hegemony is not doing things to perpetuate U.S. economic power. And that's really where we're at now, right? Which is that the way we're taking advantage of dollar hegemony is generally in ways that are hollowing out the long-term capacity of the U.S. economic system, and even of things like military and technical competitiveness. So if we want to use that dollar hegemony effectively to maintain our power, we really need different domestic policies. Um, and um, because at some point, if the U.S. is 15% of global GDP, there's just no, there's no scenario under which dollar hegemony persists. Um, as much as it may feel like it lasts forever. And the last thing I'll say about that, because I got to get this in, because uh, it's related to those d- questions of domestic priorities, is that I think that the Dar hegemony, like a lot of things, there's kind of this assumption that the U.S. will always be the lender of last resort and the U.S. will always be a safe harbor because look at how ru- well run the U.S. is, because it's always going to be a secure investment. And particularly people look at China and all the potential pitfalls for China in terms of its skewed domestic political economy and problems in corruption, uh, misallocation of resources, uh, fragility in that system, asset bubbles of various sorts, things like that. Well, I don't think the US looks so hot, honestly. And I think we can, I think one of the lessons the last few years is that a lot of things that we thought were sources of political institutional stability can be run over pretty easily. Uh, and so we're actually, between polarization and between gross mismanagement right now, we are actually not that great institutionally. Our institutions do not look so awesome. And I don't, again, I don't know how this, how those aspects of economic hegemony persist uh, in conditions where the U.S. increasingly kind of falls into this uh, sort of Central Asian kleptocratic model, which is the direction that I think we're, we're increasingly headed in. We're going to become a Central Asian kleptocracy. I didn't think it would end up there, but you know, if I'm going to take that argument from anybody, I'm going to take it from you two. So thank you. It's a really great book. I hope it's widely read. It's disturbing. It's important. And most of all, it's convincing. So I recommend it to everyone listening to have a crack at it. Again, it's Exit from Hegemony, The Unraveling of American Global Order by Alex Cooley and Dan Nixon. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having us, Mark. Thank you so much for having us. This episode of the Road Center podcast was produced by Dan Richards. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. If you like us, rate us on iTunes and help others find the podcast as well. For more information, go to watson.brown.edu slash roads. Thanks for listening.